And so welcome, this is Stephen Downs. I'm going to do a short little presentation on uh, a quick look at the future of open educational resources. I'm not sure how everything's going to work out all together here, but I hope the content will be worth the visit in any case. Uh, I am recording this uh, both locally and using the Uber conference system provided by Creative Commons. Um, your mics are muted, but I think you can unmute them. And if you do wish to jump in at any time and say something, um, please feel free to do so. Um, my local recording is covering your slide. I know that. I just want you to be able to see me while I'm doing the slide. I'm, anyhow, um, here's the slide. See, isn't this more interesting? Right, okay, seriousness now. Okay, um, so thanks for joining me. Uh, what I'm going to cover is some uh, aspects of open educational resources. I'm going to talk a bit about the technology first, and then I'm going to talk in terms of some practicalities, how we need to adjust to that technology. And I know nobody likes the technology-centered talks. However, um, I think that the technology is important because the technology is going to create some affordances for us that will change the shape of open educational resources. Maybe not next year, but certainly within 10, 20 years. So first of all, I want to talk about the cloud. Um, and the thing with the, the cloud, and I know a lot of people, especially in the global south, can't access the cloud with any reasonable this now. But more and more as time goes by, we're going to be looking at cloud environments and cloud technologies in order to create and support open educational resources. And what that means is um, a shift from resources created by publishers, say, to resources created collaboratively or cooperatively. And I'll give you an example here. Um, is uh, you know a GitHub like environment for open educational resources. Um, this here, as you can see on the screen, possibly is uh, it just looks like an ordinary website, but this website is actually hosted on a site called GitHub. And what's important about this website is that. It isn't just a website. It's something that multiple people can contribute to. Uh, it's something that can be forked or cloned, as they say. In other words, you can create your own copies of this website, download these copies to your own computer, change them as you want, upload them, whatever you want. And this changes the dynamics, doesn't it, of open publishing, open educational resource publishing, because it removes the divide that exists in the traditional environment between the author and publisher and the consumer. It makes the consumer equally a part of the creation. Another aspect of the cloud is that we will be able to create and run full applications on the internet and put these uh, applications into containers that again, just like uh, the contents of uh, a document, we can download to our own computer and run our, on our own computer. What this means is that uh, the types of resources that we will be working with in the future as open educational resources are not simply documents, are not simply textbooks. They will actually be functioning programs. They will actually be uh, functioning virtual computers that people can work with, uh, manipulate, uh, use to create things like videos or, or audio or whatever, um, and, and develop their own contents. Uh, so that's step one. And we're beginning to see this more and more um, 
just in, in the web itself, more and more websites are being run as these cloud applications. But that's background. Let's move to the next step of this uh, open data. And open data, there's been a lot of talk about open data and people are, are beginning to think about open data uh, as a new type of open learning resource. Um, so I have one person saying they're not hearing, two people saying they are hearing, so I'm going to consider that we're still doing okay. What's up on the screen here is Canada's open data portal, and you can browse this by subject uh, law, say, and go deep into, you know, a monetary penalty statistics, um, uh, questionnaires that uh, members are asking people to fill out, etc. Uh, this is all part of open government, but it's also a whole set of resources that are accessible as educational resources. Now, because it's data, it's not usable really so much as educational resources in the form that it is now. But what we're finding is that this data can be integrated into learning resources. An example of this is an application called Jupyter Notebooks. Um, Jupyter Notebooks are basically uh, notebooks containing computer programs such that you can run the computer program on your own computer. Uh, normally, you have to download an application in order to do this, but there's also a thing called Binder that allows you to run these programs right on your desktop. Again, it's the sort of thing, here we are, we're running something in the cloud. So, and, whoops, <laughs> and I clicked on something that was empty. Uh, but here we are, I'm, I've selected something that I can run this is an actual computer program that I'm running in my browser and now showing you on the screen, I hope. Um, and I can edit this program and then run it with my edits. So I can run it over and over and over again, changing all the different things, you know, all the different parameters. So my document isn't just a document anymore. It's a computer program that I can change and run again, thereby, thereby learning both about the subject matter and learning about computer programming. And what's neat about this is these computer programs can use open data, such as the data that we just looked at on the Government of Canada website, as their input. So I can be working with open data using a Jupyter Notebook uh, that I'm running either on my browser or running on my local desktop. I think that this changes our conception of what an educational resource is. Again, we're moving away from something static to something that's interactive, something that we can use to create as well as consume. Overall, we're looking at an environment of what are sometimes called headless websites or decoupled CMSs. And <laughs> that program didn't like one, or that website didn't want to run. Uh, okay. But the idea here is that your database is lo located in one place, your web page is located in another place, your programming environment is in another place, and these can be either in the cloud or in your local area. You can switch back and forth from internet to cloud as you wish. So that's open data. Now we move into artificial intelligence. And what's going to happen, what is already in the process of happening, is that, first of all, uh, open AI and open artificial intelligence algorithms are already becoming available. There's an open AI project, and there are numerous open AI projects, many available through Jupyter Notebook, for people to learn about artificial intelligence. But more to the point, 
uh, the services offered by these programs will be available as resources for educational resources of the future. Uh, I've got a simple example here, and I'll, I'll just run this one really quickly. So this is a page that I created. It's a pretty boring page. Uh, I'm hoping you can see it, but as you can see here, uh, I have a URL of an image. And what this page does uh, in the back end, in the source, is that it connects to uh, an online artificial intelligence gateway. And this gateway, in fact, is offered by Microsoft. It's part of Microsoft's Azure services. So I created an account with them. Uh, I got an API key, uh, and now I can access it. So I put the URL of the image here, and what I want to do is automatically generate an alt tag for my image. So that way, my images can be accessible. Um, you know, we can read the description through a screen reader, reader for those uh, who aren't able to actually see the image, but I don't have to go through and create all these alt tags. So, I just click on the button to analyze the image. There's the image. It's a nice waterfall. The AI has generated a caption, some alt text for the image, a large waterfall over a rocky cliff. And then, uh, as you can see below that, here's the full data from the response. Now, I can put any image into that. Uh, let's pick an image at random from some other website. And I don't have another website at handy, but I'll just find one very quickly. Uh, uh, let's, let's find mine because, yeah, sure. So I'm just waiting for, okay, I'm going to copy an image address. I'm going to paste the image address into this form now. And now I'm going to click on my button, and let's see, it says, a man wearing glasses and smiling at the camera. <laughs> that is my smile, I'm sorry to say. Um, so, the idea here, now this, this doesn't seem like a whole lot, but if you think of the full range of things that artificial intelligence technologies can do, uh, you see that you can not just create resources, not just share resources, but provide people with ways to interact with remote services in a way that helps them create. And it might help them create by creating alt tabs. It might help them create by... Uh, it might help them create by criticizing their text or maybe generating some text for them, etc. Next, we have what I call CARE. Uh, content Addressable Resources for Education. Now, what's happening here is we're taking all of these things together and behind the cloud technologies, behind um, things like GitHub, behind the AI services, um, behind open data, there's a lot of technology, technology that we sometimes today categorize under the heading of blockchain. Uh, but that's not really a good descriptor. Basically providing us with a way of storing and accessing all of these resources on distributed and decentralized networks. An example of such a network is called the Interplanetary File System. I've provided a link there on the slide. But basically the idea is this. Instead of accessing an online resource using a URL, the way we do now, we access the resource based on its content. Now, that's kind of a hard concept to grasp. The URL that uh, we use now 
points to the location of a web resource. So if I'm accessing uh, uberconference.com, I'm getting that from a very specific service uh, hosted by one particular server. Now, there are content distribution networks and all of that uh, that, that make this easier, but nonetheless, this is the only place I can get this resource. And that's a problem, especially for open educational resources, where one of the dangers is, you know, uh, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. Um, with a distributed network where we access the resource by the content, what we do is we ask the network as a whole, do you have this content? And whoever on the network has this content sends it to me. Well, how do I know what this content is? What we do is we take the resource, whatever it is, and we run it through a program that creates what is known as a hash of that resource. And the idea is that for any given resource, there's a unique hash. And this hash maps to that resource and only that resource. So if I'm looking for a certain resource, I don't need to you know, have, put in the entire text of the resource, I just put in the hash. And that can be like a 256 bit string. And I search for the hash. Now anyone who has a resource matching that hash can send me the resource. How do you know that they've sent me the real resource? Well, I take what they've sent me I run it through the same program and produce a hash. And then I check, did, what, did the hash from what they sent me match the hash that I was asking for? If yes, I know they've sent me the real resource. So this is important because it allows us to have multiple copies of a resource out there on the internet. Um, and once a resource is created and published in this way, it is permanently open. It is permanently open because there are multiple independent copies of this resource. So things like licensing and that become less and less important. Now I could go on talking about this for a long time, but I don't have a long time because this is a short or quick overview of the future of open educational resources. But let's quickly look at some of the consequences. First, uh, you know, here's how we're gonna use these or something like this, right? Uh, the creation and the use of open educational resources will merge. Um, you know, even this, uh, you know, Creative Commons, open educational strategy, uh, et cetera. Here it is. This is the document being authored it's being authored by multiple people. It's shared on GitHub. So it's in the cloud, basically. I can take this document, clone it, have my own copy on my own computer. I can make changes to that copy and then recommend those changes back to the original authors who are free to accept them or reject them. All kinds of resources are being created already in this way. So as a consequence, the creation of the resource and the use of the resource are beginning to merge. Licensing issues, as I said earlier, are backgrounded. If, you know, you put something on GitHub like this or you put something onto the interplanetary file system, uh, it almost doesn't matter what you said on the license. I mean, it does matter, but the fact that you've put it into this open network where anyone can download it and share it and use it and where that is the entire purpose of the network kind of automatically makes it open. It, it moves, you know, the, the licensing issues into the background somewhat. Another thing is that we're now able to use live data for real world applications or local or downloaded data for training or for simulations. And this is important because we can use the very same program 
for learning as we do for actual applications. And we can move from training or learning to the actual application very seamlessly. So what do we need? What do we need to know? What do we need to master in order to get to this? Well, we need to think about you know, we, we need to change our mindset a bit. We need to change our framing a bit. We need to start thinking in terms of data and networks rather than documents. Get away from the idea that we're publishing course packages, uh, chapters, modules, and things like that. Rather, we should be thinking in terms of environment and experiences. What kind of environment are we creating for learners? What kind of experience are we making possible? It's not about the content of the resource anymore because the content's coming from open data. It might be anything, right? Uh, it's about uh, how we merge this data with this application or this capacity or this bit of artificial intelligence to create a learning experience for a person. And that's a different way of thinking about instruction and instructional design. And then finally, we need to learn, all of us, to co-create cooperatively. Uh, we need to, sometimes they talk about, you know, we need to be able to work in the open or open working. Uh, and that applies to our educational activities as much as any other activities. I've been uh, creating these uh, talks in uh, Google Docs and sharing them and allowing people to come in and edit them if they want. They're not editing them, but they're coming in to take a look, uh, putting all these things online, making recordings. I've created an open educational resource in the process of giving this talk. And uh, I wonder if, oh yeah, I am recording here in, in the conference system as well. So we need to be thinking that way. It doesn't mean we all have to be lined up doing the same thing, you know, marching to the same drummer, etc. Uh, you know, the whole nature of distributed content and distributed resources means that you can use the content the way you want to use it. I can use the content the way I want to use it. If I want to change it a bit, that's fine. That's the way the system is built. Uh, and then we contribute back, we contribute back the changes that we've made for other people to adopt or not adopt. Again, it's up to them. So we're working cooperatively. Each of us has our own objectives, but we're still able to share an environment and share a set of resources. That's my talk. Um, and that's my talk within the time limit because they're very strict about that here in the uh, Creative Commons uh, all day talkathon. Are there any questions or comments before we go away? Hey, Stephen, that's Nate Angel. Nate. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Really uh, interesting uh, talk, lots of really great information. And I had one question for you. You know, a lot of the things that you're looking at, uh, you know, obviously kind of future leaning, but um, require pretty significant technical expertise to get involved with right now. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you have ideas about as we move on this arc that you're describing, um, how those technical barriers might be decreased for folks. Yeah, that's the biggest challenge right now. And, uh, you know, I've been diving into this and there's a huge learning curve. GitHub for itself, by itself, is a huge learning curve. So what we're going to need to see are user-friendly interfaces for all of this. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they're going to look like, um, but, uh, you know, if you will, sort of like the content management system of next generation interactive cloud technology. Uh, you know, the previous world of open educational resources was really difficult until things like Blogger and Facebook and Twitter and some publishing services like Rice's Connections came along. And that's what we're going to need for this next generation as well. Um, what's the acronym for? Acronym for acronym for that for what? 
Oh, sorry. You just uh, you you said a, a phrase that was like the. I don't want to say oh, next. It was next generation cloud delivered something platform. Oh, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> maybe uh, it needs an acronym. Oh yeah, uh, maybe somebody with a better facility for naming things should name it first, and then we'll give it an acronym from that. Although I liked care content addressable resources for education, but I mean that doesn't cover the whole cloud thing, right? It kind of focuses specifically on what these resources are. Anyone else? If not, uh, we're coming on 128, so yeah, I better uh, call an end to it. There's probably somebody waiting to come uh, on. So, Stephen, just so you know, there are uh, a couple of questions in chat there from Christina. Oh, yeah. Maybe uh, you can address them quickly. How would uh, OER repositories, etc.? cetera? Um, the good model, Christina, to look at is GitHub. Right now, it's a terrible model just in terms of usability, but the way it's set up is going to be the model. Behind the scenes um, is a thing called the directional acyclic graph, DAG. That's the technology, and it uses something called Merkle, M E R K L E trees, which are graphs of these hashes that I was talking about. That's the technology that will be used. Not that anybody can use it just, you know, in an everyday way on their computer yet, but this is coming. It's in the future, right? All right, got to go. Uh, oh. uh, DAG, uh, Directed Acyclic Graph, or Merkle Graph sometimes known as Merkle trees. Oops, that's misspelled. All right. Cool. All right. Bye, everyone. I'm turning off the recording. Call recording off. And I don't know how to turn this, stop this. <laughs> I'm just going to hang up.